So hello everyone, welcome to this week's Siegel Seminar. This week we're delighted to have two speakers, both from UC Davis. Firstly, we have Dr. Andrea Schreier, who is an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Animal Science at the University of California, Davis. She got her PhD in ecology from UC Davis in the Genomic Variation Lab and was a postdoc, then project scientist there before getting a faculty appointment and taking over the lab when her mentor, Bernie May, retired. Andrea uses genetic tools to answer ecological and evolutionary questions about fish and wildlife species with a special interest in sturgeon. She has worked with resource management agencies to improve conservation aquaculture programs throughout her career. And then secondly, we have Dr. Mandy Fisher, who is an associate project scientist in the Department of Animal Science at the University of California, Davis. She also earned her PhD in ecology at UC Davis in the Genomic Variation Lab, followed by postdoctoral work with Bernie May. Dr. Finger is now a project scientist and lead geneticist for the genetic management of the Delta Smelt Refugial population, I probably pronounced that incorrectly, apologies, but more broadly, she enjoys collaborating with agency biologists and other researchers using a range of molecular tools to understand and manage threatened and endangered species, including California native trout, desert fishes and long fin smelt. So with that, I'll pass it over to you guys to begin. Thanks. All right, so um, thank you for a great introduction and thanks for inviting us to come and talk with you today. So I'll start out and we'll swap to Mandy about halfway through. And we're gonna be talking about how our lab applies genetic and genomic tools to improve conservation aquaculture, which is basically captive breeding of endangered fishes. All right, how do I advance? <laughs> I'm not a teams person. Okay, here we go. Um, I wanna start up by bringing up some concerns that livestock geneticists and wildlife geneticists share when considering captive breeding. So, you know, we're both concerned with avoiding inbreeding. We design uh, mating schemes very carefully to avoid crossing relatives because we don't want inbreeding depression in our populations. We also want to purge deleterious traits from our population. And one classic example of that occurring in an endangered species breeding program is with California condors. So when they brought all of the remaining wild birds into captivity in the 1980s, um, they found that three of the 14 founders were carrying a recessive allele for a lethal trait that um, caused condor dystrophy in condors. Um, so they had to remove those three individuals from their breeding pool. And then finally, we're, we're careful about what individuals we include in our breeding population. We may have different criteria about what makes a, a, a good individual for, for captive breeding, but um, we do have uh, criteria. But there are some differences in the what we focus on between livestock genetics or, and livestock breeding and endangered species breeding. So I would say that our main impetus in captive breeding of endangered species is maintaining genetic diversity. And that's mainly because captive breeding programs have a goal of producing individuals to be released into the wild eventually. And with conservation aquaculture, often that release happens yearly. Um, and so we want fish that are released into the wild to be able to adapt to the natural environment, and they're gonna need genetic diversity to do that. Another difference is that we wanna minimize selection. So we do not want our, our fish adapting to the unnatural hatchery environment um, because they're not gonna survive well in the wild then. Um, and one way we can do that is to continually bring individuals from the wild population into our captive broodstock. And that can be done in a number of ways. If you have a closed broodstock or you uh, contain captive broodstock, you can occasionally supplement it with wild individuals if there are individuals still extant in the wild. And then some programs simply rep replace their broodstock every year. So they bring in wild individuals, spawn them in captivity and release them every year. And that just continues. And then I briefly want to introduce our laboratory. Um, so as Colin mentioned, we're in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis, and we are a group of undergraduates, grad students, postdocs, technicians, project scientists, PIs, that are all really excited about applying genetics and genomics to answer ecological and evolutionary questions with a direct relevance to management and conservation of fish and wildlife. So the conservation aquaculture work we do is sort of one arm of that. 
And I'm going to go through a couple of studies that I've led um, using genetics or genomics um, to address questions related to conservation aquaculture. And then I'll hand it over to Mandy and she'll talk about her extensive experience with the, the Delta Snot refugial population. Okay, so um, the first project I'm going to highlight was a dissertation chapter for a former PhD student, Amanda Cohen. And we were approached by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife because they wanted to develop a genetic management plan and potentially establish a conservation uh, breeding program for the Sacramento perch, this cute little guy here. So Sacramento perch is the only native centrarchid in California. So it has a special value to the state. And its native range is indicated in orange here in this figure. So it's the San Joaquin and Sa Sacramento rivers, the Pajaro and Salinas rivers and Clear Lake. But um, the species has been extirpated for almost their entire native range. So now the species is confined to these little isolated reservoir populations that you can see mostly outside of the native range and even into Nevada. And the state wants to reintroduce the species back to their native range. So they wanted us to look at genetic diversity levels and patterns of genetic structure in the species to help inform their development of this captive breeding program. So Amanda did Bayesian clustering with some microsatellite data collected from all of these different populations. And she found that all the populations sorted into two genetically divergent clusters, the red cluster and blue cluster, as you see here. And what we inferred from this is that there were two source sources historically used for the establishment of all of these um, introduced populations. And perhaps not surprisingly, really poor records were kept um, when all the stocking occurred in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So we, we know nothing basically about what the sources were. So we're just inferring there were two based on this. And then she was interested in looking at substructure. So she took all of the populations in the red cluster and all of them in the blue cluster and did additional clustering with them separately. And she found that there was additional genetic differentiation within those two clusters, likely due to genetic drift after these populations were initially established. So you've got kind of a founder effect plus genetic drift happening after that. And another uh, main finding, and sorry for this really busy table, um, was that the populations that comprise the blue cluster tended to have lower levels of genetic diversity than populations that comprise the red cluster. So I've denoted the blue cluster populations with these this blue shading, and you can see that heterozygosity levels, number of alleles um, are all lower. Um, there's one population that is inbred, and the effective population size is very low. So what we recommended to CDFW is that they may want to consider first drawing from populations in the red cluster to establish their captive breeding program to capture those higher levels of genetic diversity. Also, these populations with low effective population size and low genetic diversity are probably at risk um, and, and should be monitored um, going forward. Okay, now I'm going to pivot to talk about genetic management of the conservation aquaculture program for Kootenai River White Sturgeon. So as Colin mentioned, I have a special interest in sturgeon. I've been working on them for two decades now. Um, and white sturgeon are considered to be the largest freshwater fish in North America, although technically they're diadromous. Um, they inhabit the Sacramento San Joaquin drainage, the Columbia snake, and the Fraser River drainages on the West Coast. And um, in this figure, you can see a bunch of little hash marks here, and these all represent um, dams that affect or impair the movement of sturgeon uh, within this, this region. And also you see, um, well, let me back up and say this right here is in the box is the Kootenai River, and it's a tributary to the Columbia. And you can see a little like, triangle there, oopsies, and that is a natural barrier that has separated the Kootenai River from the Columbia River for about 10,000 years. So there's been no gene flow there. Um, the population has low genetic diversity, probably because of a founder effect. And then this dam here, number 10, was put in in the 1960s, and it essentially just destroyed the only spawning population or only spawning site for this population. 
So there has been no natural reproduction for white sturgeon in the Kootenai River since the 1960s. But because sturgeon can live over 100 years, there's still a remnant population of adults that were born before the 1960s, and they're being used as broodstock in a conservation aquaculture program run by the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho. And what they do is every year they go to the spawning site around the spawning time. They collect a number of females and bring them into their hatchery. They monitor the progression of um, basically preparation for ovulation that occurs in the, the sturgeon, the female sturgeon. And once they ovulate, they go back to the spawning site, collect sperm from males that are hanging out at the spawning site, bring it into captivity, fertilize the eggs, and then rear the progeny for 12 to 18 months until there is a good size where they will um, survive well in the river and then they're released into the river and all the adults that are brought into captivity are released into the river every year and our program has done um, genetic monitoring of the brood stock so we've genotyped all of the brood stock that have come into and were spawned by the program over time and we also posed the question about whether or not post-release mortality in juveniles could be affecting the amount of genetic diversity that's actually preserved by the, the captive breeding program. Um, and, and one, I'll step back and mention that um, white sturgeon aren't ancestral octopoids. So we're a little bit limited in the genetic tools that are available to us, but we now have a SNP panel that was developed by a collaborator that we're starting to apply to this captive breeding program. And we're um, looking to see if the SNP panel, panel can be used for pantage-based tagging. So just some quick results. Um, we've been monitoring this, the brood stock used in this program since 2002. And remember I mentioned we're limited in genetic tools. All of this has been done with microsatellites. And you can see that the percentage of alleles that are extant in the whole population, about 70 to 80% of them are represented in each group of broodstock that are spawned every year. And then if you look cumulati cumulatively over these years, the total amount of genetic diversity that's present in the river that's been captured by these broodstock is close to 100%, so that's pretty good. Um, but we were curious about whether or not all of these fish that are being released into the river actually survive. So in collaboration with a state and a provincial agency, we mined a, a very extensive juvenile hatchery recapture database. So um, the agencies go and monitor the, the, the hatchery individuals that have been released. And a number of them were tagged with pit tags so we could trace them back to their family in the hatchery. And for ones that we couldn't, we performed parentage analysis with our broodstock genotypes and assigned them to family. So we had a data set of 4,500 recaptures. And what we found was that 55% of the families, different families that are released into the river actually survive. So that means that 45% of them actually don't, which is was not what we were expecting. And what you can see in this figure on the, you've got your class down here, starting from when the program originally started in the mid 1990s. And on the Y axis on the left hand side, you have the J prime evenness statistic. J prime value is close to one, indicate that individuals um, are distributed amongst all of the families that have been released pretty evenly, whereas a J prime value need close to zero means that there's a lot of variability among families and who's represented out in the river. And what you can see is that in the early years with, the, with these black bars, there was pretty high survival after release, and most of the families that were released actually have surviving progeny in the river. And that kind of makes sense because at that time, there were no juveniles in the river because there's been no natural reproduction. So the competition was quite low. But you can see if you look at more recent years, the proportion of family, like the, the distribution of individuals among families gets a lot smaller here. So it's a lot more variable. And looking at the right hand y axis here, the proportion of families with recaps, which are denoted with the diamonds, you can see in some of these years, some families had a ton of individuals that survived where most families had no survivors. So what we learned is that monitoring 
the popular monitoring the conservation aquaculture program just looking at broodstock is not really the best way to do it because not all of those broodstock eventually leave progeny that are going to recruit to the adult population. And finally, I'll touch on our work with the SNPs, which we're super excited about. Um, the SNP panel was developed by the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, and it uses read counts in order to genotype the SNP across all the, the different copies of the gene in this polyploid species. Um, so you can see A2 counts and A1 counts here and how they are classified into different genotype classes. Um, and I have a PhD student, Aviva Fisk, who's working on validating the accuracy of parentage analysis using this SNP panel. And she's looked at within three different year classes, and I'm showing here the least accurate year class and the most accurate year class. So essentially her accuracy in assigning parents between, um, and she's got half sibs and full sibs, like the whole, the whole gamut, um, it ranges from about 95% to about 99%. So the tribe is really excited about being able to use this panel because what they'd like to do is start releasing larvae at a, or releasing juveniles at a larval stage. So too small to get a pit tag to track that they've been in the hatchery. Um, and they wanna rely on this genetic tag to be able to, to trace them back to their hatchery family. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is a little bit different. Um, so I mentioned that sturgeon are ancestral octoploids. Well, we recently discovered, not really recently at this point, we accidentally discovered in 2011 that white sturgeon can spontaneously autopolyploidize in culture. So basically they can spontaneously triplodize. So in this uh, flow cytometry plot, you can see a peak corresponding to the normal uh, genome size. And then these 12 ends, these dodecaploids here, are essentially genetic triploids of the, the normal sturgeon. And unlike with most fishes, when triploidy occurs, both male and female 12 end white sturgeon are fertile. And when they cross back with these uh, normal fish, they produce individuals of intermediate ploidy that are 10 end. So this kind of shocked everybody because producers in, in conservation aquaculture or commercial aquaculture for sturgeon were not trying to make triploids. So I know that this is a, t a technique that's used in some industries to get more desirable traits in their fish, but this was not the intention here. Um, so, and, and what we found was that it varied pretty widely among families produced in the hatchery. So some families had no spontaneous autopolyploids. Some families had up to 90% of the individuals produced were spontaneous autopolyploid. And in the Kootenai River population, that tended to be on the higher proportions. Um, so it really was a problem. They didn't want to be releasing individuals with abnormal ploidy out into the river. And over a couple of years of studying some of the 10 end fish, we discovered that although the males exhibited normal reproductive development, females had abnormal reproductive development. It took them much longer to um, advance to their their sexual maturation than it did for 8N or 12N white sturgeon. And in the Kootenai River, it can take females 25 to 30 years to reach sexual maturity. So delaying that was not really that great. Um, they also found that the 10N females had really fatty ovaries and they produced fewer eggs. So that reduces individual fecundity um, and, and definitely not something you want in a, a population you're trying to recover. So the question was, what was creating these 12N fish unintentionally in culture? And we were able to track down that it was the result of second polar body retention, but we weren't sure what was causing the second polar body retention. So I worked with research associate um, Joel Van Enidem, who is an expert at um, expert in sturgeon reproductive physiology. And we were wondering if there was something going wrong during a process called deadhesion that could be causing the spontaneous triploidy. So after fertilization, sturgeon eggs clump together. They get, they get really sticky. They clump together um, in captivity. Normally, they would just get sticky and clump to the substrate of a river, but in captivity, they clump together and they don't get as much oxygen. They're susceptible to disease. 
So what producers do is they mix the fertilized eggs in a silty water solution to coat the eggs with silt so they don't clump. And the timing that this occurs is within the time frame that if you were to induce triploidy in the species, you would want to do it during that time. So we were wondering if the process of stirring the eggs could be causing the problem. And Joel had mentioned that he had seen um, people stirring very gently with a feather, like you can see here, this photos from the Kootenai Tribal Hatchery, all the way to the ex other extreme where he has seen people splashing around in the eggs with one hand and looking at their phone with the other hand. And so we did an experiment where we stirred eggs with different levels of vigorousness, I guess is one way to say it. And we found that stirring them too vigorously significantly increase the rate of spontaneous autopolyploidy. So now all of the conservation and commercial hatcheries for sturgeon are very, very careful during this deadhesion stage. And we've been able to drastically reduce the proportion of these 12 end fish and therefore the 10 end fish produced. All right, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Mandy to talk to us about Delta Smelt and the little hatchery that could. Yes. We decided that since we have animation in, in our slides, we should use the same computer yeah. <laughs> to avoid any technical difficulties. So anyway, um, I'm talking about Delta Smelt and the FCCL. And uh, let me inter introduce you to Delta Smelt first. Uh, the scientific name is Hypomesis transpacificus. It is a true smelt. It has an annual life cycle. Um, it is endemic to the San Francisco estuary. And so on the left here, you see a map of California. And in the inset is the map of San the San Francisco estuary. And so we live in the Central Valley and Andrew showed a photo of this, the white sturgeon habitat. And it's, it's a bit similar in some ways. It smells like cucumber. Trust me, it really does. It's, it's quite, <laughs> quite amazing. It once was one of the most abundant fish in surveys and California Department of Fish and Wildlife has been doing annual surveys at different stations throughout the Delta and in the triangles, there's, well, the the, uh, the little squares are the trawl sites. But anyway, it's, it's a long-term data set and it was once one of the most abundant fish. And it's kind of a, a chill little fish. It moves with the tides and the river flows between the freshwater Delta and the brackish Sassoon Bay. Is it this one? Down. Oh, weird. There, there we go. go. So um, I I pulled this off of the internet yesterday. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, the smelt down in the Delta. So the Delta smelt is very nearly extinct. Um, and it's due to a combination of reasons. Uh, the classic habitat loss in California I know you guys probably know that we have a pretty dry climate. You probably hear about our wildfires and the big droughts. And not only that, but there's a lot of water diversions because of course we are a big agriculture state. Also non-native species, and then of course a severe drought. So people notice this because we do have these long-term data sets and they were listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened in 1993 and state listed in 2009. And here is a figure of the number of fish caught in the fall midwater trawl and you can see here in the 70s it was quite up and down but sometimes quite high and then in the yellow starting around 2000 it started to really decline we had a good water year in 2011 you see this little blip here and then in the last few years they've caught no fish no delta smell whatsoever so fortunately people who were actually thinking ahead um created a hatchery for Delta smelt. The first thing to do was to be able to complete the life cycle in, in aquaculture. And so this was coined the Fish Conservation and Culture Laboratory. And note that the conser conservation is before the culture, and that's because it was founded explicitly as a conservation hatchery. And it was founded to prevent total extinction of the fish just in case. You know, at the time, this was 2006, 2008, you know, people were like, oh, you know, extinction could happen, but but we don't know. And like I said, it was founded explicitly as a conservation hatchery, meaning it was not production focused. And uh, 
monitoring and adaptive management is incorporated at every step of the way. And we wanted to address the genetic concerns that Andrea mentioned head on. And we do this by creating single pair crosses, so one male and one female. And we did not want to mate any individual fish more than once. We use kinship to reduce inbreeding. Um, every year, the FCCL goes out and they collect wild brood stock um, to introduce into the hatchery because it's important to keep the, the hatchery population as wild as possible. In addition, we have a backup duplicate population every year at a different facility, just in case, um, which is pretty smart because you know we are in, we are an earthquake state. They do happen, and there is a different facility up near Lake Shasta, and every year some of the fish from the FCCL is trucked up to Lake Shasta for the hatchery just in case something happens to the FCCL. In addition, we mate wild caught fish together to create a new founder group. Our founders are considered to be unrelated. So when you create a new founder group, you have a whole lot, you know, their offspring are, can be mated with anybody with quote unquote zero inbreeding. And I'm mentioning this, I'll come back to this later. So here's a photo of the facility and it's pretty small as you can see. I mean, the good news is that Delta Smelt are, are also pretty small. So they can, you can fit a lot of fish into a tank. So let me walk you through spawning season and the details aren't that important, but what I want to impress upon you guys is that it's really, really labor intensive the way that it's set up. So the FCCL, the hatchery, they sort through tanks of fish from the previous year when they're about a year old and they feel them and they determine if they are ripe and ready to spawn soon. And if they are ready to spawn, they tag a fish. And you can see here in this left photo, there's little tags in these fish and they each have two letters and two numbers. So when they tag 96 fish, they fill a box, as you can see here on the right with the fin clips, and they send us two boxes at a time every week to genotype and do DNA extraction. And currently we are genotyping the Delta smelt at 74 SNPs, and then we conduct parentage analysis. So on spawning days, which are every Tuesday and Friday from January to May, as an aside, that's also when the tagging occurs. So that's at that point, they're about a year old. The FCCL sorts through the tagged fish and then they send me a list of the right females. And what do I do with this list of right females? I select the appropriate males and I have a software program that um, calculates kinship that we were able to get based on the parentage analysis. And I, I make the crosses based on low kinship and some other factors. And then the fish are strip spawned and you can kind of see there that in the photos, into these little bowls, and then we have eggs that become baby smelt. So why do we have to do parentage? And as you saw in the photo, the hatchery is pretty small. And so what happens is eight families go into each tank. In 2022, we had 39 multifamily groups. So each tank contains a multifamily group, this MFG. So Essentially, there's 312 possible single pair cross crosses. And so we actually have to do the parentage in order to determine which family each tagged fish belongs to. You know, if each, each family was in its own tank, you wouldn't have to do this, but it just creates that extra step. But the good news is that it also lets us do genetic monitoring. Oh, that's right, I touched the thing. OK, um, so the first generation of fish was made by crossing wild two-year-old fish. And um, the, the fish were two years old, even though they have an annual life cycle, they can live to be two years old. But in two fish were captured in 2006. In 2007, it just wasn't, they just weren't ready to, to make the crosses for the refuge population. And so they were two years old. And Dr. Katie Fish founded this program at the time. And then I, joined in around 2010 and was just doing the genotyping. And then I took over making the crosses in 2011 and 2012. 
And I started to notice something after, you know, we'd have several years of data because this had never done, been done before. I noticed that the offspring of the wild fish weren't being recovered, particularly the, the fish that were wild by wild crosses. And I want to remind you guys that a major component of this program is that we have to successfully bring wild genes into the population. If you catch a fish and it doesn't successfully get crossed, then it's it's a waste. But we needed to quantify this, and so I used a measure called relative reproductive success. Um, and I calculated that if cultured by cultured fish had a relative reproductive success of one, then the wild by wild relative reproductive success had declined to a low of, of 0.17. So wild by wild crosses only had 17% of the success of culture by cultured. And here is a figure and it shows the F0 generation was in 2008, F1, 2009, and so on. And we weren't bringing in as many wild by wild fish. So that's one reason why the blue, which is the wild by wild, does go down. But another thing that you can see is that the red, which is the culture by culture crosses, is going up. So they're also getting better at having their offspring survive. So that was really interesting and a bit alarming. Um, but one thing that we did do to implement changes to avoid this is we decided to not make any more wild by wild crosses. There's just no point in doing it if the offspring are not going to be going to survive. So we were only making culture by wild and wild by cultured. And you can see that cross type is in green and it has about 50 percent. It's still lower, but it's not nothing. So meanwhile, uh, we're doing our hatchery program and seeing the news and the wild population is continuing to decline. And the FCCL has a much harder time going out and capturing broodstock. And this is from a report. And a set is basically when they throw the net out and look for wild fish. And the number of sets in 2018 and to 2019 was 111 and they caught 28 fish. In 2020 to 2021, they set 450 times and only caught two fish. This is really bad. There's no wild fish to be caught. So we implemented some other changes because of this lack of wild fish. And as I said earlier, we were only supposed to mate each fish one time to reduce inbreeding, but we started mating wild fish more than once as another bet hedging strategy. Like we don't want to lose these wild genes. They, they need to be brought into the hatchery. So as you know, this we're sacrificing this increased relatedness, these half sibs that are being created to keep the population more wild. In addition, because they can survive to be two years old in captivity, we started holding lower wild fish and what I'm referring to as low DI, which is low domestication levels fish that did not mature into the following season so that they can be spawned as two-year-olds. So what is the mechanism for this? Um, the good news is that with this hatchery, we have a lot of data. So I wanted to know what can we do with the long-term data set that we have. And we have really great pedigree and recovery records. So two postdocs worked on this project and I'm gonna breeze over these results, I am sorry. Um, and we wanted to know, has time to maturity changed over time? And we investigated this because Salmonid research has showed pretty substantially that run timing in salmon and age to maturity of salmon is selected upon and the hatchery. So hatcheries do select for earlier maturity. So we were like, what is, is this happening in Delta smelt? The good news is that they, they did not find evidence that time to maturity had changed over time. They asked another question, has the variance in time to maturity changed over time? And they found indeed that yes, it has declined. So when wild Delta smelt are brought in, there's much greater variety of time to maturity than after several years in the hatchery. So that's kind of interesting and it begs the question what happens when they are released into the wild. So the second project I'm gonna talk about uses archive samples because obviously we get fin clips so we can do genomic analysis and those fin clips have DNA that is in our freezers. <laughs> so we wanted to know, are there genes associated with domestication index? Do individual fish whose parents have been in the hatchery many years are there genes that are selected for in them? 
And another really interesting question is, are there changes in the methylation profile? So we've been doing some epigenetics work. So this is my graduate student, Ensi Habibi, and she has been taking a genomics approach to understanding domestication. And as I said, we wanted to know, can we detect genetic changes as a result of the number of generations in captivity at the FCCL? And so she used rad sequencing data. We actually have whole genome resequencing data that hasn't been completely analyzed yet. But the short story is yes. In the meantime, we also assembled the Delta Smelt genome. So we have been doing a lot of genomics where we Delta Smelt. And she used a sliding window FST approach and an FST outlier analyses. And she did find a region on linkage group on chromosome 22 that appears to have four genes in the region that is under selection. And the genes associated is a zinc finger protein and some transcriptomic factors, which is what we do when we arm wave about genes that we found that are under selection. We don't really know what they're doing yet. The research has just begun. She also found she used the pedigreed samples and compared wild fish with their offspring and then their offspring and then their offspring. So she had essentially four generations of fish that she was analyzing over time. This figure here is a heat map showing methylation differences. And the blue shows down hypomethylated and the red shows hypermethylated. And on the left, you have generation zero and on the which is wild and on the right you have generation three uh, males and so she found 201 differentially methylated regions and that is being written up right now these are her chapters for her dissertation and so i'm hoping these publications go out and the genes that she found that were um differentially methylated were had to do with swimming ion transportation which could be salinity tolerance and yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, so this brings me to, I'm checking the time. I'm sorry, I wanna make sure I don't go over. So this brings me to the big, big news. And that is that I didn't mention this before, but for all the work that goes into the Delta smell hatchery, no fish had been re released into the Delta. It was a one way street for these wild fish to get caught and brought into the hatchery. Why, you might ask, well, that's a really good question. And it mostly has to do with fear. And as Andrea mentioned with these captive breeding programs, you, you really, you're worried about harming the wild population if it still exists. Um, you also, you know, California is a highly regulated state with water, well, with everything, but specifically with water and the number of the index from the surveys of how many smelt there are in the wild would affect water allocations. So, okay, if we're gonna put hatchery fish into the Delta, well, okay, how do we decide what the index is? Do hatchery fish count as wild fish? We don't know what to do, what do we do? Um, so nevertheless, there is has been a move towards supple supplementation because facts are facts, you cannot catch any more wild fish. And in addition, there was construction at the FCCL and they lost a ton of multifamily groups or tanks of families. And many of these had wild parents. So all of a sudden, you know, you had a catastrophic loss of, of many, many wild genes. And people started asking, what's going to happen to the hatchery population? You know, if you can't bring in wild fish, then you're going to have this little boutique hatchery population just continues to differentiate from the wild population. If you don't, if there's no, the Delta smelt are not in the Delta anymore, they're hatchery smelt. So again, inbreeding and lack of wild fish and people started to really realize the longer we wait, the harder it will be. And then also um, there's just interagency alchemy that is that is way over my pay grade. I don't know how these decisions are made or why they're made when they're made. So I'm going to give you, I'm almost done, a brief headline in stories and photos because Delta smelt is big news in California. You guys are up there in Canada. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Delta smelt. And in fact, a lot of people in California have never heard of Delta smelt. And I'm just shocked because I'm like, where do you know where your water comes from? So in 2015, these headlines started coming out. You saw the trend lines in the survey graph that I showed you. This was 2015. This was 2020, 2020s. Here's another fun one. Um, and I just did a Google search for Delta Smelt and these just popped up. Like they are 
they're easy to find. Extinction's edge, biologists continue to find zero delta smelt in the San Sacramento San Joaquin waterways. So as I mentioned, everybody decided that there needed to be supplementation, but there was all this fear. So we had to do experimental supplementation. And this led to this cage study project where fish could not be released into the Delta, which I understand, but researchers at UC Davis and California Department of Resources had these experimental cages designed and then hatchery fish were placed into them to see, can they live? Can hatchery fish even live in the Delta? The good news is that they could, and this, and we got some really cool drone footage as well. So, which brings me to the next year when people are like, okay, it's go time, we have to do this. And this is the headline, with Delta smelt all but gone in the, in the wild, a first ever hatch and release effort aims to save them from extinction. And here we have a photograph of our hatchery babies that we have lovingly doted upon and cared for about to be released into the Delta for the first time. So what is the future? Well, the good news is that some of those fish were captured many months later. We know that because they ad clipped them. They clipped their adipose fin. They've clipped their adipose fin. But in my lab, the little future that we're looking at is we have to find a spawning strategy to scale up production to produce 125,000 fish every year for supplementation. And you saw the facility and you saw how we make the crosses and it's impossible to do it the way that we're doing it. So we're doing some alternative spawning strategies to figure out how can we create more fish while not sacrificing the genetic diversity. We're also creating a GTC panel with Fish and Wildlife Service. They have another lab up in Washington state. And this is gonna be used for long-term annual monitoring of captured fish, if we ever capture any, and there's enough to actually do GTC on. So people are actually trying to think ahead now, and that's really great. And also, we hired a software engineer to develop cross-selection software to automate the cross-selection process and also reduce human error. And the big future? Uh, well, long fin smelts are also in trouble. So it's very likely that we will also have to develop a conservation hatchery for this fish as well. And Andrea informed me that I think that they just got listed under the Endangered Species Act this week, last week. I don't think the official announcement went out. Last it's week. hot off the presses. Yeah. Anyway, Delta smelt, I don't know, but there is going to be a lot of work for conservation hatchery managers. Mm -hmm. And that's all that I have. And I think I made reasonably good time. And we have a list here of all of the funders and a lot of the people who have helped with these projects. I am funded by California Department of Water Resources, Bureau of Reclamation, State Water Contractors, Fish and Wildlife Service. So, yeah. And we've got Kootenai Tribe of Idaho, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Western Regional Aquaculture Center that funded some of the spontaneous autopolyploidy work. All right, so we're happy to take questions if anyone has any. Great, thank you both for the great talk. Yes, so anyone in the audience, feel free to raise your hand and turn on your camera to ask any questions that you may have. I can't yes, tell Fabio. See if I, see I know I can't either. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both of you, for, for presenting this very, very interesting seminar. It's great to hear something different from anyone yeah. who is just uh, with livestock. We were but, worried. We were like, we looked at your website and weren't sure what you would be interested in, but we were like, that's what we do. We're going to go for it. Yeah, I know. It was really nice. I have uh, uh, one question to start and then a comment. And, and my question is uh, to Amanda. Um, I am completely ignorant on delta smelt, right? So uh, I wonder which is the ecological importance of this little fish? What's the ecological importance? Yes. yes. That's so, a great question, and everybody really, asks it. It was really abundant, right? It's suddenly disappearing. So I, I wonder if the um, birds are, are kind of 
uh, uh, suffering because it was the main source of uh, food for some birds. So, yeah. So the honest, honestly, the ecosystem is so altered, it would be hard to even know what the consequences are because everything is different. The whole regime has changed mm -hmm. in the estuary. However, it is considered an indicator species, and they are certainly not the only fish that's in trouble in the delta. To answer the ecological importance question, I don't think we quite know. We know that they're gone, um, and so things must be happening. It's not. It's it's the non-answer answer. I apologize for that. No, no, no that's totally fine. I just uh, what if we have a key key, key importance like you, that you know. Uh, but of course, any species that we are Losing is important, right? Right, yeah. Uh, can I have a, a comment uh, to you? Because I think the, both of you, in the in the, the very beginning of the presentation, uh, you mentioned that, well, we are going to talk about uh, preserving genetic diversity because it's important for populations at risk. Mm -hmm. I just like to tell you that uh, even though we have a working species like uh, Bostaurus and uh, specifically, let's say, but a host in breed, uh, we are very concerned about the genetic diversity. Oh, yeah, good. Because mm -hmm. the yep. effective population size in hosting, at least in Canada nowadays, is approached to 60 animals. Wow. So we have many populations of your fish that you showed them, the excursion, that have a much higher effective <laughs> population size. Yeah. yeah. So just the ones in blue that you, you mark in blue, they are lower than that, but the other ones are all twice, three times. So for yeah. of like diversity, uh, we have the same concern. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. yeah good Even to know. though the population are millions and millions of cows, right? Right. But I guess the difference species. is that they're not the wild fish that we care for are not. You know they're they're subject to the wild nature and all this habitat loss and everything. But yeah, it is very important. Yeah. So, do you guys try to increase your effective population size then, or or no? Uh, not really. What we are trying to do is to monitor and trying to mitigate the loss. I see. Got it. Time, right. Because so the easiest way to increase would be using. Uh, Crossing, right? Crossing right. with other bees. That would be the easiest one to do. But, you know, crossing a hosting cow with another dairy breed, uh, the level of production is not going to be the same. We know that. But we are constantly, we are trying to uh, to mitigate, you know, uh, future loss. That's uh, the approach. And uh, my last comment, okay, that I was surprised with the, the accuracy of the parental staff being 95 to 98 percent using SNPs. Mm -hmm. Because in cattle, we use nowadays, I think there's 200 SNPs that are approved for parental staff. And in the, the, the four, the SNPs are using uh, microsatellites, 20 microsatellites, that was the standard. And, and, and the SNPs, the accuracy is like the same as the microsatellites. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how many SNPs are you using? For the parental staff. Good question. We have a panel of 300 SNPs. 300. It, even, yeah. Even bigger than the 200. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but that, that's one. Uh, but, uh, we have to know more than, I don't know, the number of chromosomes and all this uh, aspect, the uh, level linkage equilibrium that would affect. But I was surprised. I thought uh, uh, it could be a, uh, to get a better accuracy. But anyway, the, it's a different uh, genome, right? Yeah, the white surgeon genome has 250 chromosomes. And oh. so, oh. yeah, okay. when we, we do have a panel of 13 microsatellites that we use, um, but because of the polyploidy, we can't, we don't have co-dominant scoring of microsatellite yeah. genotypes. So that really reduces the power for our analysis. And with the SNPs, we can actually score dosage of the different alleles, which increases our power. Yeah, and also it's a GT seq SNP panel so that we can genotype hundreds of individuals in a single single sequencing lane. And with the microsatellites, it's just very labor intensive. Oh. So yeah, that's no, why we're looking to change. 
I'm not proposed to, to go back to Microsoft. Like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, like, it's just because my experience with the cattle and uh, mm -hmm. live pot, I need like maybe, as I said, cattle 200 snips, and you get really, really high accuracy. The same as mm -hmm. you get with the very informative uh, micro satellites, this mm -hmm. 20. But I didn't know about the genome structure. Um, yeah. Version, so it's very different. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but don't go back to. We need to be much more uh, automated, right? Mm -hmm. Not going back to labor and a uh, lot of work on uh, at the lab level. Okay, so that's all. I'll give a chance to others to ask questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Flavio. Do we have any other questions in the audience? While we're waiting, I might. Oh, we do. Chrissy. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for your very interesting presentation. I was wondering if you have any theories on what is being selected on in the Delta smelt for their domestication. And are there any examples from other conservation breeding programs uh, where they were able to figure out what was being selected on during this domestication process? Well, with salmon, so, so most of the research is in salmon. Mm -hmm. And as I recall, and my student is way more up on this than I am, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, it's also embarrassing, but uh, it's early run timing is one of the things. And so we, that's why that was one of the first places that we looked is, um, are they being selected for, not early run timing? I'm sorry, early maturity. And they are not being, they are not maturing any earlier, which is good news. So the hatchery's actually done a pretty good job of, of maintaining diversity and not selecting for early maturity, which is surprising because, you know, when you have, when you're starting this tagging at the beginning of the season, you only tag 200 fish at a time. By the end of the season, there's about, 2,800 fish to choose from, you know, or 3,000 fish to choose from. So you're going to be, you know, mating those early maturing fish at the beginning. You're selecting them explicitly. Mm -hmm. So I was actually really surprised that we didn't find early maturity. But to answer your question, we, we don't know yet. We're still looking. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a couple years in the making now that the, the quantification of domestication selection ostensibly that was published in 2018 i forgot to put the citation down and then and then we got funding to kind of really mm -hmm. investigate these changes so i don't know yet but if you think about like what what is different in the hatchery versus the wild you could think about density population density and like there's more disease in the hatchery than the wild stuff like that so you could like hypothesize right but but yeah, yeah you can just, hypothesize all day yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, I, don't no, I was I was wondering if you had like a next direction of where you plan to look next. Well, unfortunately, most of the money since supplementation started is going to supplementation. So a lot of these basic science questions on domestication that I was able to do, the funding is a bit drying up. We are working on a few more kind of like fishing expeditions, I want to say, it, but we don't have a clear direction to go in yet. So we have that whole genome resequencing data set and we have some transcriptoma data set that is currently being worked on and the epigenetics for some experimental crosses that we made. So we made a lot of high DI crosses and a lot of low DI crosses. And interestingly enough, the experiment had to be ended early because of the low domestication crosses, the offspring died before we wanted to even harvest them. So that just shows you there's something going on there and I we don't know what it is yet, but we did manage to save some bodies and stick them in the freezer and we do have some data so you know we'll, we're going to keep working on it all right uh, good luck and i'm looking forward to seeing that in the future <laughs> thanks so much sure thank you chrissy yeah well, i think i'll ask one quick question as well more so for you andrea regarding the sturgeon you mentioned that they they can survive up to is it 100 years old was it 100 I, plus we don't know so just extent. wonder yeah so just wondering from your guys perspective and you're more so interested with conservation and maintaining genetic diversity have you ever like 
looked at specifically those like a group of those older animals that have been able to survive mm -hmm. in the wild for a hundred years they've been able to deal with changes in environment levels of pollution and everything to see if there's an associate or some or association analysis with that group to try and determine if there's certain SNP or whatever kind of mm -hmm. associated with producing a more resilient animal or res resilient fish in this case. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, as I mentioned, the genomic resources for the species and most sturgeon species are fairly rudimentary at this point. So I'm working mm -hmm. right now on sequencing the genome of a green sturgeon, which is listed in California, so it's easier to get funding for it. Green sturgeon are sympatric with white sturgeon and part of their range, and they're at least in the same clade, but they're not sister species. But we're hoping... Um, that if we have a good green sturgeon genome, it might facilitate the assembly of a white sturgeon genome if we could ever find money for it in the future. So it's it's been really hard because white sturgeon, the only listed white sturgeon population is the Kootenai River one, and they have so many pressing concerns that don't involve needing a genome mm -hmm. <laughs> that they really, um, there hasn't, there just hasn't been the funding available. But yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Like what- They still have to be able to reproduce. Yeah, and living they, long is yeah, like yeah. is useless if you don't. Mm -hmm. And the Kootenai River is a unique case, just because you know the population would be doing fine if the habitat was there. Okay. And they're very stubborn; they will not go spawn. They've tried to entice them to spawn in other places, but they're sort of they they just home to that same spawning. So I guess that's not very adaptive. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, it's no, a, the habitat that, is the main limitation right now. But it's amazing sure. that they live that long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one follow-up question, just regarding one of the early graphs that you showed, I think it was from your release of different families across the years, and there was a big drop in 2010. And I was just yeah. wondering, was there an environmental issue that really caused that, that was like known about within California, or was it just that group just didn't succeed? Right. So that the releases are happening into the Kootenai River, which is up in Idaho and British Columbia. Um, but I'm trying to remember what happened in 2010. I do know around that time, the tribe was experimenting with releasing at different ages. And so they've really dialed in at this point what age gets them the maximal survival with the least amount of time in the hatchery. But it's possible that that was a year where they were releasing at earlier stages or releasing at different times. So there was definitely there there are definitely some practice changes that occurred in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, but the outcome, you know, regardless, the outcome is the same. That not very many parents from that year class have progeny that are in. The wild and i should mention there are a few males that have been used in the hatchery multiple times so they've been given multiple opportunities to sire progeny that could go out but so far there aren't any females that have been used multiple times so if a female's offspring haven't been represented thus far like she would need to be spawned still to you know like she hasn't ha they haven't had multiple chances i guess mm -hmm. to put progeny out okay thank you any other questions while we wait? There's a couple of comments in the chat. I don't know if you guys have access to that. it from Angela, do. who was, who, I believe Angela, you did your PhD at UC uh, Davis. <laughs> uh, no, well, I did, yeah, part of my PhD and my postdoc there, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, were you with Juan Medrano? Yes, yes. Yes, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. So, yeah, I, my fa uh, yeah, your face is uh, a little bit Super familiar. Yeah. <laughs> I so think we, like, yeah, we yeah, were in we the crossed. department at the same time. Yeah, yeah. and some <laughs> seminars, yeah, some uh, department meetings, and yeah, mm -hmm. we share. So, just yeah. I wanted to say hi. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you. Yeah. Nice to see you too. And again, thank you very much for the great, yeah. um, very interesting presentation. That's yeah. amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Big thanks, Angela. And since we're at the 2.30 mark, I'll probably, mm -hmm. it's probably a good time to hold up there. But again, thank you both for the great talk. And for everyone in the audience, we'll see you again next week. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You too.